The library is very delighted to be partnering, partnering with the Wellesley Symphony Orchestra today. And here is Ten Chris Tenike, orchestra member, and he will MC today's program and give you a little bit more information. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, and uh, I'm glad we found a place to come despite the rainy, raw, really dreary day out there today. Uh, Leslie Holmes was hoping to be here today. She's the president of the Wellesley Symphony, but she uh, has no voice, and hopefully will recover soon. So I'm Chris Tenick. I'm the, the principal trumpet for the Wellesley Symphony, and uh, working with uh, Carol Davison on the outreach here. And uh, uh, it's uh, we've been here for several years, and it's great to be here. We have a few things uh, to mention regarding the Wellesley Symphony Orchestra. Uh, we have a family concert coming up March the 18th, just down the street at Mass Bay. Uh, at 1.30 there will be an instrument petting zoo, so we hope that you all come uh, and uh, try the instruments. And uh, at 2.15 there is a show and tell, and then a 3 o'clock uh, concert with a lot of uh, uh, some movie tunes and some uh, singing, and uh, that really looks to be a great program. Uh, there are some materials uh, on the table there for the Wellesley Symphony. We have you look like an awfully literate crowd, and who can definitely use some more bookmarks. I can just tell. So please grab a bookmark. We have uh, these postcards about the season. Uh, you can sign up to be on the uh, the mail paper mail mailing list, as well as get on our uh, email list, uh, which gives you notice of the concerts. You can also get there via our website, www.wolsey.org, and we very much hope uh, that you will join us at an upcoming concert. Uh, this program itself will take about an hour or so, and we, are, we will be hanging around after. So I hope you do come by and uh, uh, say hello. And uh, let's get started with the music. So uh, uh, we will be playing the Rondo. I'll say a few more words about that after by uh, John Joseph Moray. And uh, would like to call out that uh, I think this is Carol Davidson's debut in the percussion section. <laughs> so we're, no pressure. We are very excited about this. Uh, anyway, uh, Rhonda. Wow. <laughs> Can't go without notice, Carol. No, I'm sorry. We have a spotlight. That's it. All right, we're ready. that we are 
going to cover today is to, uh, of course, play for you and to say something about our instruments, um, which uh, we will do that uh, after the next piece to start that. Um, and uh, some of the things about music that make it, well, uh, music, of course, with the composers too. Uh, Moray himself was uh, uh, lived in the late 1600s, early 1700s, was kind of a French, not quite a prodigy, but was pretty well known, I think, even as a teenager. Uh, and this is one of the pieces that um, uh, he has left for us. Uh, it was uh, a um, uh, fanfares, I believe, was the, was the title of the piece itself. Uh, it was the theme to Masterpiece Theater for quite a while, uh, as you may recognize. And now, of course, in the age of sampling, there's a bit of a ghost of it in today's, uh, uh, today's uh, program. Uh, this next piece is by the great Henry Purcell, uh, who was an English composer in the late 1600s. Uh, he was an organist and uh, uh, composed everything. And if memory serves, he is buried next to the organ at Westminster Abbey. Uh, and uh, uh, really a great influence on English music and, and music in general. So this is the Allegro and Air from King Arthur. One of the things that I, uh, to mention, and I'll digress a bit, what is it like to listen to a piece you've never heard before? How do you get a sense for even what's going on? In this particular piece, there's something you hear very often, which is call and response. Somebody plays something, another player will sort of play in response, and so much music is about that. Who's got the ball? And uh, I urge you to... Uh, or I suggest maybe you uh, uh, keep an eye on that, and uh, that may uh, help uh, help you enjoy the piece a little bit more. All right.
Brass instruments are, you know, their main characteristics is they are metal, made of brass, which resonates nicely. Um, but I have to say, one of the things that you know, I think somebody, sometime, looked at a bunch of pipe and said, you know, I think we can play music with this. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're able to do it. So, uh, in most cases. The um, uh, trumpet itself, this is a B-flat trumpet, the standard trumpet if you play in a band, concert band. It's most often used for all of that kind of work. Any trumpets you see with rock bands or general business or weddings or that sort of thing. But they are in many shapes and sizes. Um, they are uh, in different keys. This is a B flat, so if I hit a, a B flat on the piano, that's the C on this instrument. It gets confusing when you start. I also I did bring along, and I'll be playing it later, a variant uh, which is called a flugelhorn. Peter's holding that up. It's really the same uh, basic construction, the same length, plays the same notes, but you can see the shape is very different. It's very conical, or the trumpet is more spherical. And so that gives you a more mellow sort of sound, along moving towards a French horn, which is an extremely mellow uh, uh, sound. Uh, the last thing, just to, uh, you know, there's a lot to know about it, but uh, the, the way you produce sound is vibration, right? The vibration starts with the player. And the way that you make the vibration is getting your lips in such a state as they'll vibrate when air passes through it. Something like... So not so musical, and you really can't do it for a very long time. So uh, we have a mouthpiece, which is really a focuser and provides a lot of support so that you can get on the way to controlling this. You can play for longer, and you can also play more notes. Then you get to the trumpet itself, which is a real, which you've heard a lot already, but its job really is to resonate and to amplify. And the, uh, with most brass instruments, with one really glaring exception, which you'll find out about later, uh, we use vowels, and that allows you to play the entire chromatic scale, the white and the black notes on the piano. Without using the vowels, you have to play something which is known as the overtone series, which is very limited. But as you probably heard with the older works that we've started with, the, the music really focuses around those fun, those fundamental notes. I really can't play much else, at least not. It sounds okay. That was a really a better idea. All right, what do we have next here? We have the Galliar. Oh yes, okay. This is by uh, uh, Galliard Battaglia, which is by uh, Samuel Scheidt, another favorite of, of composer of brass players. This is very much in the call and response. Uh, it kind of reminds me of that song, was it Oklahoma? Anything you can do, I can do better? No. Uh, yes. Annie Annie, get your gun. Annie, get your gun. Thank you. And you can see the two trumpet players are really going back and forth with the, uh, the other players sort of throwing a lot behind one player or the other. Galliard Battaglia. Thank you. 
Yes, you are. I'd like to introduce our horn player today, Michael Wells, who will talk about the French horn. So, you remember that Chris, Chris was talking about how you make a sound with a brass instrument. What did he do? He, anybody do it? <laughs> so all the, all the instruments, we all do that, but we all have these mouthpieces into which we do them. And this is a French horn. Um, a lot of pipe, isn't there? You know how long, any one time, how, any guess to how long it is, how much tubing I'm playing through at any one time, roughly? Any guess? 18, 20, 20? 22. <laughs> Actually, it's about 11, there's a, but, but there's a lot more here, and I'm going to explain why that is, and, and where the horn to go from. You see, it really came from this. <laughs> this is a French, yeah, this is a, a French hunting horn. And the horn first developed, really, is a signaling device. And so you would have people you know, riding on horses. And why was it like this? Why this big loop? That, that loop is not so big. But if you think about it. <laughs> that way you can carry your horn with you, whether you're uh, riding the horse or whatever. Uh, as Chris demonstrated, there's an overtone series that you can play. And on a longer instrument, actually, the notes can get closer together so you can play more of them. So I'll demonstrate that. Thank <laughs> you. 
So it's just different horns all in one. So I can play. And that probably is enough about the horn right now. But that gives you an idea how it developed from an instrument in the fields to an instrument that is now used in the orchestra in brass groups and wind groups and so forth. All right, uh, so I'm happy to introduce uh, Carol Davidson, who also plays viola, and uh, also uh, Jennifer Wright, and they will talk about uh, playing between violin, or viola, and Represent every section in the orchestra, at least minimally. So that's why we have a flute from the woodwind section and the viola from the string section. And before we play, um, Jennifer is going to talk to us a little bit about how the flute works. So the flute is the member of what family? Does anybody remember what family this is part of? Yes. Woodwinds. That's right, woodwinds. This is a wooden instrument. No, <laughs> but it used to be, and most of my partners in crime are made of wood. Um, the oboe, the clarinet, the bassoon are all made of wood. This instrument's very different in another way. All of the other instruments should blow into the instrument. And let me show you what happens when I do that. is unusual in that you blow across the hole and the air vibrates through the length of the tube to make the sound. It's the only instrument in the orchestra that does that other than the piccolo. So I'll show you that. and that's going down the line in, the, in terms of pitch. So um, the viola is an inner voice. We get to play a supporting role. You know, like get the Oscar for best supporting actor or actress in this case. Um, so we play a lot of harmonies, um, sometimes interesting rhythms against the melody. A uh, very famous example is the um, it's called Coming Home theme from Dvorak's um, New World Symphony, where the English horn has this gorgeous melody, and the violas get to accompany. We don't have the melody, but we get to accompany, and it's a beautiful, beautiful moment. So um, we're going to play, oh, one other thing, the viola is tuned a fifth lower than the violins, um, and we have the same, um, we start with a C string, and go up to an A string violin, start with a G string, and go up to the E string. So they can play a lot higher, and the instrument is smaller. Um, so we can play lower. The cellos are also from C to the A string, but they have a much greater range than the viola. Jennifer and I are going to play for you um, some music uh, at first by uh, Georg Philipp Telemann, who was a German composer who was a, a um, a contemporary of Johann Sebastian Bach and Georg Friedrich. 
um, and he moved to Helsinki, and he wrote thousands of pieces. And in true Baroque fashion, most of the pieces can be played by any number of instruments. But in this case, it seems that he actually wrote this duet for flute and probably viola da gamba, but I don't play that. So this is going to be on the regular old viola. Bartok, who's a 20th century composer. 
Um, and these are probably duets that he wrote for teachers to use as um, learning tools. And if you didn't, we use them anyway. Um, they're super for teaching because it's so much fun to play with your teacher or for the teacher to play with the student <coughs> and learn how to count and keep the place and play in tune, all those good things. I got my first trombone when I was nine years old. 
that summer my family went to Disney World and I heard a Dixieland band and I was just, I'd never heard Dixieland, I'd never seen a trombone in person, I was enamored. We went to school in the fall, we got to pick musical instruments, I was like, I want that one. But the one I got, and if any of you decide when you're allowed to pick an instrument that you want a trombone, which would be an awesome choice, you only get one little loop of tubing here in your first trombone. And then, if you go to high school, you'll probably get a trombone with two loops of tubing. And then if you get really carried away, like John who has a tuba today, but sometimes when he plays an orchestra, he has a trombone with three loops of tubing. And that's like what you're learning about with the French horn. Each loop of tubing allows you to play more and more notes. Um, anything else you want to know about a trombone before I go sit down? around you so you can walk down the street. It's the same instrument, but that way. Now, you usually hear the tuba playing bass notes. Let's see. You know, like that. But you can do a lot with it. Um, even Mahler wrote something that went. Uh, 
um, how much that is in brass. Uh, this particular one, you know, again, tubas are made all over the world. The big, the supposedly best ones are from Germany, but this one was made in Japan, and it's very good. It's a Yamaha. So I don't know what else I can tell you about the tuba. Any particular question? They're not all 16 feet long. Some are longer. Yes. Do you know how long is the longest? How long is the longest? Okay. This tuba is in C. And you remember they talked about overtones. You make a tube this long, and you can play certain notes. Then you start adding vowels. There are tubas in B flat, which would be 18 feet. You could theoretically make one a lot longer, but I'm not sure an actual human being could play it. <laughs> I mean, you know, seriously, when you think about it. This, that's a lot of tubing to blow air through. Yes, ma'am. How many places make tubas? All over the world. I don't know about tubas, there's actually, you know, there's actually a brass instrument factory in Hopedale, Mass. Makes wonderful trombones. Tubas I don't know about. The other thing that's kind of interesting is getting bigger all over the world because there's a company called Cool Wind, and this, this addresses the, uh, the weight of the thing. A company called Cool Wind is starting to make them out of plastic now. I myself have not bought a plastic tuba, although my wife is very nervous. <laughs> and uh, they sound a lot like a plastic tuba now, but they'll probably get better. Anyway, that's that's the tuba, and uh, I'll go back and sit down. <laughs> oh, one more question. Sorry. Question? Yes. Is there any tuba bigger than that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. My, uh, I have a. That's kind of a baby tuba. Huh. No, not really. This is, uh, this is, it's funny. Uh, people have come up with different ways to measure that. This one is called a four quarters tuba because that's full size, four quarters. There are three quarter size ones, which are just kind of smaller. Perhaps if you wanted to learn the tuba, you probably have to have something smaller. Um, very often the professional players in major symphony orchestras play something called a six quarter tuba, which is not necessarily any longer, because that has to do with the note you want, but just bigger. This has got a like a 17-inch bell. I've, I've got one at home that's got a 24-inch bell. It's bigger, kind of a fatter sound. Not better, just different. Like having a dump truck instead of a, you know, an SUV. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, you know, you, it's like a tool. You know, for some things you need a big wrench. Okay. <laughs> Go. Play some more music. Thank you. Yeah. All right. The program says we're going to do two trumpet tunes in here, but we're going to do one trumpet tune. Uh, just to uh, uh, make sure we uh, end, end on time. Uh, this, these are again uh, pieces by Henry Person again, and uh, you probably heard that he had a real gift for making very memorable, uh, remember, memorable. Uh, melodies. Uh, this tune is used often at weddings and other processional sorts of events. Uh, and so, if you uh, uh, are planning any weddings, I recommend this one highly. Uh, anyway, this is a uh, trumpet tune. So just the, just the, the first, the first, first one, the first one. Yeah. Can't the the okay. And I'll just mention some of you came in early before the program really started, which is really fine with me because the. What I really, one of the things I really like about music is sort of the messiness and getting things together. You know, we're playing, it breaks, it falls over, what happened, how can we fix that, all of that kind of thing. And that process really is, is really, to me, just about as much fun as performing, really, and sort of working working things out. We haven't rehearsed until today uh, with this with this piece, uh, with these pieces. We, you know, we obviously are experienced players, so we know these pieces. But still getting together and playing people in different roles. Let's try this. Let's try that. It's really a lot of what what makes this uh, uh, makes this fun. Okay, here we go. So we are playing the first one. We are playing the first one with, with, repeats. with repeats. Rule number one of ensemble playing: play the same piece as everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> the main goal is to start together and end together. Hopefully, the middle will also be. <laughs> Thank you. 